So uh, it's a great pleasure to have Professor Eva Silverstein from Institute for Theoretical Physics, Stanford University, California. And uh, I'm not giving a detail, detailed introduction of Eva's work. He works in different, different regime, including cosmology. And he, uh, she will going to talk about a uh, very interesting subject where she did, uh, she had written some paper recently. And uh, uh, this talk actually based on two of her works, which is pointed in the first page of the slide. The title of the talk is Multipoint Correlators in Multifield Cosmology, Formal Structure and Its Application. So Eva, you can now start from your end. Thank you for uh, giving this uh, nice talk and uh, agreeing to give the talk. I know that the situation is not going well everywhere, but you are supporting us. It's a great honor for us that you are giving the talk. Thank you. Well, thanks to you for organizing this wonderful series. Um, I'm happy to do it. Um, and uh, please interrupt with questions or comments at any time, everybody. Otherwise, I'll feel like I'm talking to myself. So um, let me, whoops, uh, I'm sorry, I need to minimize the videos. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about uh, the subject of multipoint correlators in cosmology, primordial cosmology, um, based on these two papers with George Panagopoulos, a, a student of mine, and also one to appear with George and two others, Deshaun and Alex. So here's our collaboration meetings lately. <laughs> they are by Zoom and they involve, um, so this is George, Alex, Deshaun, Pedro, uh, Lyra, and Zeta. Okay, and this, this bunny over here is Zeta and we're gonna be very interested in her tail. Is um, it I don't know. Mouse, I think. No, Sounds no, these are oh. rabbits, so. so oh, uh, okay. uh, th this is, this is the Pedro is, oops, Pedro is a, Pedro is a rat, but he's a pet rat. Uh, but these two are, are rabbits, um, and um, as you can see, they're part of the collaboration. I'd also like to thank, additionally, uh, Mer uh, Meridad Merbabai, um, Leonardo Sanatori, Matias Aldariaga for a lot of input over the time of this project. Um, okay, so I'm going to start a little broadly. Um, in quantum field theory, generally, um, starting with Minkowski's space-time quantum field theory, so nothing about cosmology, there's been an interesting development over the years, um, roughly started by Voloshin um, quite, quite some time ago now, uh, and, and other people around um, probably the uh, 80s, 90s, who got interested in the following question. So if you have inside some diagram in quantum field theory, uh, a particle that can decay to n other particles, um, how large is that? Is that amplitude and ultimately the probability for that process? So at tree level, just by some simple combinatorics, and you can almost kind of see it from the, from the picture of these graphs, there's a factorial enhancement in such, such connected correlation functions. So um, there's a nice recursion relation where you can see the tree, tree diagrams, uh, the, their number is factorial. Um, and if you work in a certain kinematic regime, so uh, in particular, starting with all the outgoing particles at rest, or, or close to that, of course, when you integrate over phase space, there's some spread around that, that you know, needs to be there in order to have some support. Uh, but anyway, near that regime, um, you find a precisely calculable result for the amplitude, which, which grows like n factorial times the appropriate powers of the coupling lambda. In this case, for say lambda phi to the four theory, that's, that goes like lambda to the n over two. Um, and so, uh, Eva, what is yeah. m squared? Is it the mass? Yeah, m squared here is the mass. So. Uh, so we're at threshold and there are a bunch of propagators in here. So you can, you can imagine where that's coming from. Um, right. So um, 
then, you know, it's a very natural question to, so this by itself would seem to indicate that the strength of these effects is controlled not just by lambda, but by, by, lambda, by lambda times n or uh, um, lambda to the one half times n. Um, if you look, if you say use the Sterling approximation for this factorial. Um, and in, fa in fact, the lambda n squared pieces turns out can be resummed. Um, so it is a question of lambda times n effects uh, when it comes to trying to understand what happens to this at the quantum level and over a wider range of, of kinematics. So um, this is a, a subject of ongoing interest. Um, here listed are a number of the authors involved. It's got a kind of um, interesting and bold proposal behind some of the discussion and debate in the liter literature um, having to do with an idea called Higgs explosion, where if in fact this effect persisted in the standard model in the Higgs and up to you know, an, an energy scale well beyond, beyond threshold, um, then it would you know, be saying that the Higgs can decay with, with a large probability into many, many particles. And that would be um, interesting, very interesting and surprising because it would mean that the Higgs fails to be a good quasi-particle at what turns out to be a re relatively low scale. Um, so it was kind of an approach to the hierarchy problem. But it's very difficult to establish that. And in fact, um, I mean, it becomes a highly quantum problem, um, although some semi-classical methods apply. Um, so that hasn't been, uh, that idea hasn't been confirmed. Nonetheless, there's been a lot of interesting research analyzing things that are basically related and getting super interesting answers for those. So um, I'm just here, again, listing a bunch of uh, people's work um, in the flat space-time case because our focus is going to be on the cosmological version of this where ironically the calculations are quite a bit easier so that will be part of the fun um, but just to mention it in this uh, Minkowski space-time version we have um, some developments in related quantities that have to do with for example um, large charge sectors of quantum field theories so that, as you can imagine, is related to high endpoint functions for many, many uh, operators n because those create such, such states. And there have been calculations that, that uh, work out, for example, the anomalous dimension of such an operator and um, make uh, you know, valid semi-classical approximations to that calculation. And, in so doing, people have found interesting results like a kind of large emergent tuft expansion at large charge, as opposed to say, for those who follow ADS-CFT, as opposed to large color number. So, um, uh, you know, this is something that I think is very, very interesting. Um, we encountered this in the past in this, in this old paper with Polchinski in a different context where we noticed that in a theory with uh, not many colors, but many, many, many um, charges, you still had a, a large, uh, you had still had a holographic description with a large radius and the gravity dual, meaning um, in particular uh, an emergent tuft expansion. So uh, this, I think, if it's much more general, which is what I believe these, these works are, are getting toward, uh, then it's, it's, it's a very interesting um, piece of this, of this development. Um, but in fact, as I, as I alluded to already, the point today will be that it's easier in the sitter space and it's more like the, the, um, the tree level threshold version of the problem. It's not quite that, but it's, it's closer to that than it is to the uh, more challenging, highly interacting uh, uh, problem in the, that the Minkowski version um, has uh, proget progressed to. So, Reason for this is something that we all know, and I saw that in this series you, you've had talks from um, Senatori and Pimental, I think, and so you're primed to understand this very well, I'm sure, um, and I'm sure many of you work on this as well. So I'll be brief about the basics, but um, as you know, in an inflationary uh, expanding universe, say approximately exponentially expanding, the modes stretch out, and there are, it, it, particularly if there are uh, more fields than just the inflaton field, 
then those have meaningful interactions outside the horizon. Um, and they're doing that in this highly gradient diluted uh, in this kinematics with very, very small gradients. So in that sense, they're automatically, you know, essentially at threshold at this in this kinematic regime where it's much easier to compute these things. So the first comment um, is that, you know, whereas in the Minkowski space, that threshold version is not just kind of like a warm up, it's not really the problem of interest. Here it, it is, um, and that's a, a wonderful thing about how this inner space time can actually simplify some theoretical computations. Um, I like these ironies in general. I just have one question. So yes, this, uh, this, uh, the k by mod k by a, it goes to zero. Is it for uh, like outside the horizon or inside the horizon? It's um, for outside the horizon. Um, and then as you know, at the end of inflation, yeah, uh, yeah. these things enter and they, you know, the interactions that they've had get or depending on you know, you know further interactions, those can mix in with the observed perturbations. So yeah, I'm referring to the outside horizon evolution at the moment. Um, does that does that help? Yeah. So is yeah. It like outside the horizon means it's almost classical type of. Right, it's, it's what, you know, uh, Starbinsky would call uh, classical stochastic. So it has a quantum aspect to it for sure. Um, okay. And, and that, you know, it was derived carefully from the full quantum field theory recently by, Sen by Gorbenko and Senatori, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so you're, yeah, you're asking about the right physical regime. So right now I'm just kind of giving a little, uh, you know, somewhat slightly more intuitive point that uh, these, this effect that I was just introducing in, in um, flat space quantum field theory was, you know, e easiest to calculate a threshold, but that's not too much of interest there, whereas here it is, that, that's so far the, the logic. Um, I want to mention another place where the, this aspect of the center space simplifies rigorous theoretical work, in fact, rigorous mathematics, which is that uh, there's a proof of Kerr st stability of the Kerr black hole, which is a, you know, very basic physical question. Um, by Andres Vasi and a collaborator whose name escapes me right now. And that, that proof exists in the sitter space time. It does not, there's no such proof known in, in uh, uh, flat space, asymptotically flat or radius space time. And, you know, that's because of something similar intuitively. It's that the, some of the problematic perturbations dilute away. <laughs> so um, it's interesting because in the HEPTH world, people sometimes behave as though the sitter is, you know, hor you know, overwhelmingly complicated and may not exist in all this. But uh, in fact, in some ways, it's simpler. So the, these are two examples. Okay, so in this talk, the point will be um, this, the simplicity and some results that follow from the calculations that, that we can do. Um, the First point is that the this n factorial enhancement does persist in a way that's calculable in multi-field inflation, um, in a you know wide range of uh, fields and interactions, as in the sense that we'll see. Um, and then there are some applications of that. So there are uh, some more model-dependent applications of that very general formal fact uh, that include new new um, forms of primordial non-Gaussianity and also, um, you know, a, a new mechanism for primordial black hole production, which in general is associated to the tail of the probability distribution, something that is in turn related to the high point correlation functions. So these are two natural applications, um, and but they, despite the generality of this first statement, those those applications are are model dependent, but still um, interesting. In particular, we'll see that if this field space uh, involving the Impluton field and these additional fields that I labeled chi has a, a hyperbolic geometry, for example, which is something that could be motivated from various theoretical considerations, that the tail is extremely heavy. So um, then there's a range of possibilities uh, below that. Um, and then there's a, there's another um, paper that we're writing uh, that would 
that uh, as a sort of extra spin-off here, which will um, which will um, uh, lead us to a, a another one of these p of x sort of inflationary models, uh, one where a branch yeah, cut means you want to just only consider the kinetic type of plus. This x is the yeah d phi squared sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, but those are actually few and far between in terms of being derived from anything. Um, and what we'll find here is um, one that, so one of the first one of these that I think was concrete has a square root branch cut, which introduces a speed limit for uh, the phi, the infoton evolution. Well, in this case, context, we'll find a logarithmic <laughs> branch cut, which does a similar job. So that'll be a fun kind of spin off as well. Okay, so we'll be interested in the tales of this distribution in general um, related to those endpoint functions that I introduced. Um, so I had two okay, so uh, questions in the previous slide of yours. So yes. this, uh, uh, you have said this in uh, factorial enhancement. Mm -hmm. So uh, this factor is particularly coming from, you were saying for multi-field inflation. Well, it's there um, classically, rather generally. It's just that in multi-field inflation, there's meaning to these this the outside horizon evolution of the these extra fields. So, uh, perhaps Leonardo used the term single clock in his in his long talk that you had that you hosted. Um, so this is beyond that, and that's why it's important to have um, you know if you just have the one. Uh, field, then there's no real, I mean, roughly speaking, there's a more proper proof of this going back to Bardeen, but basically the idea is that um, that is degenerate with simply rescaling the coordinates once you're outside the horizon. But if you have additional fields that are independently evolving, then that gives meaningful interactions. So um, it's always, so even for single field, in other words, one would have this, this question and this challenge, but um, for that, the only real interesting dynamics is inside the horizon, and it would revert to the Minkowski version of the problem. So that, that question is still open, um, in other words. What I'm saying is easier is this one for the multi-field case. And one more, uh, just uh, uh, to sure about that, uh, like model dependent means uh, model dependent uh, in the inflation or something else? Yeah, it means, um, that yeah basically i can i can summarize it right right here and now so i've drawn this picture of some distribution um say in some direction in field space or just say a one point probability distribution in some volume um and you know the tail can be asymptotically heavier than the gaussian tail but the question of whether that's whether that's visible has to do with what the probability is at the point where it it starts to exceed the gaussian tail um okay. and that's that's the thing that's model dependent and it's you know it's exponentially sensitive to to the model parameters so you know it's it's yeah in some field theory path integral you might be able to imagine that immediately that there there's that exponential dependence of um but it kind of ranges from hilariously unob unobservable to hilariously um you know huge <laughs> and 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 because of that strong sensitivity so that's what i mean Okay, um, so let me just again start start very broadly. Um, what are these primordial perturbations in cosmology? I know you've heard a lot about them in, in your series, um, but I'm gonna you know be very general about it because of because of our goals. So there's some wave functional of those perturbations. I've included the scalar one in a in a common notation for um, some gauge fixed version of that tensors, other fields. Um, and, you know, once you include these other sectors and imagine you're basically observing this zeta um, or two derivatives of it, uh, the, the um, it, you know, in general, this is going to be in a highly mixed state unless you tune things incredibly much to make it, make it uh, not. Um, and, and then when you trace over chi, um, you're left with the probability uh, distribution for the things you you can observe, and that's what we're interested in characterizing here. 
Uh, I'm going to drop the tensors and focus on the scalars. Um, and you know, there's you know, non-Gaussian entity is like every other non-term in physics, non-Fermi liquid, non-this or that. It's, you know, almost everything is, you know, almost nothing is Gaussian. So um, we should think very generally about this uh, object and what kind of behaviors it can, it can have and what kind of um, information it can contain. Um, so of course, this is a, by now a very old and mature subject. It goes way back. Um, if one does single field slow roll inflation, uh, then you know, this is a negligible, negligible effect, although you can compute it for completeness. Um, it is known for a long time that if additional, you have additional fields, it's, it's less constrained and ultimately we understand that it has more, um, it has uh, characteristic shapes at the level of the three point function and beyond. Um, at some point, we stumbled on this fact that uh, even for a single field, um, there's no need to impose a slow roll condition. Self interactions can slow the, the field down, um, even say on a steep potential. In such a scenario, naturally leads to larger non Gaussian entity, um, even at the level of low point correlators. Um, this was incorporated into a more systematic bottom up treatment by many, many folks. Um, <laughs> and there's you know, a lot of ongoing work to uh, understand more about this, um, including what the effect of symmetries, if you impose uh, symmetries, um, if you have you know, more generic, less symmetric situations, what kinds of uh, features that in, in, imprints, uh, and so on. And it's something that's very interesting. It's something that's partly observationally accessible. It's also something that's essentially impossible to do systematically because of the infinitude of forms that this can take. So, you know, we do our best from top down, bottom up, and, and try and characterize it in various uh, interesting corners. Of, so, um, uh, Eva, I have two yes, questions yes. in this slide that uh, uh -huh. uh, you have mentioned about these heavier fields. So, uh, is it possible that this chi field you are talking about, it might be a heavy field? Mm. So, Today we will, in general, it could be, um, and it could be stochastically evolving outside the horizon and you know, there are many ways it, it, it could. Um, for today, uh, we'll play with some sort of simpler examples of chi, just, just so that we can be very explicit um, where it takes the form chi to the p, where p can be any, any number. Um, but, um, what our goal here is not so much to uh, access higher mass scales. That is something that is also happening in various ways. Um, um, I think uh, you heard a talk Monday about that stuff, I assume. Um, there's, yes, actually a, yes. there's actually another example of that, which I was going to get to, that um, makes less symmetry assumptions and still finds um, sensitivity to masses that could be of order 100 times time, times Hubble. So I'm going to cover something related to that question. Okay. Um, but for today, for today, we're not focused on the um, the case where this chi is 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 heavy. Yeah. So why okay. I have asked this question because, like, you know that there are different kind of um, like partially massless scalar, heavy scalar, different different things exists. So I just want to ask that. For, uh, so different different categories of what kind of distribution you expect so that, that's why I have asked actually. what kind of distribution of masses do I expect no no the this p the probability you have computed oh yes uh-huh yeah, yeah what kind of distribution does this yeah, yeah that, that's the question I mean I, I think it's um not an easy question to answer in general but we're we're heading toward um, uh, an answer to some aspects of that question to do with what in particular is going on for high point functions in the tail of this distribution. So that's where we're going. Um, uh, maybe it'll be clearer when we keep going. Yeah, sure, sure. So um, let me keep going generally and then I'll get more to specifics. So when it comes to observable sensitivity, one would ideally like to evaluate the so-called likelihood, this, this probability having traced over every, everybody else, the chi fields. Um, 
and you know compare that to data and just figure out which which theory has the highest likelihood um, but that's not really practical this is some um, i mean maybe on either side the, the theoretical and observational side um, although maybe it's easier i don't yeah i haven't thought enough about the observational side but um often we just work with certain proxies for for this so correlation functions um endpoint functions that it's useful to obtain from their generating functional so from quantum field theory as always we know that that generating functional can be obtained from the original path integral uh, through this convolution with e to the j times times zeta um, and and then the correlators are obtained by n derivatives with respect to uh, j, the source j of, of this w of j um, so we'll, we'll work with that quantity below um, and you know we can then uh, work these out and most of the effort has been at relatively low n doing this and you know compare that to to data with appropriate estimators and such another proxy would be a histogram a, a one point pdf um, which you know in, in a observational volume would be summing up all the points um, up to some resolution um, and plotting the histogram uh, number of points at some value of zeta hat within some resolution. Um, and then one could compare that to a theoretical histogram obtained by averaging that quantity uh, against this probability distribution in the theory. Um, in order to really make use of that, one would need further statistics of this object. Um, but that, that is something that might be motivated by what we find uh, today. And it's another thing that is a, a gross simplification compared to the, the big general problem at the top. So we can keep that in mind yeah, as we how, go. How, how, how you actually fix the value of uh, k max? Mm. That is um, something to do with the, with the experiments. So I'm not going to comment um, too much on that. OK. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's related both to experiments and our theoretical understanding of foregrounds in those experiments, I, I guess. So um, okay. yeah. Um, Okay, so um, this, you know, there's been heroic work on the observational side to constrain various directions in this enormous space. And, you know, that has been a big uh, deal in the field. And this is, I think, basically the latest is this paper um, from Planck. Um, so, you know, a lot is known about certain directions in this, in this space that are, are now constrained, um, but one hope, there's a lot of hope to push further than this through large-scale structure, um, for example. Uh, but also what we're stressing here is that one can um, push further on the theoretical side too by understanding better what the observables really are and not prematurely um, specializing to only low point correlators with um, big symmetry assumptions. So um, that'll, that'll be the theme. Um, there was a recent example we found that went beyond low point correlation functions, um, which involved heavy particles, which is what you uh, asked about. And this is um, a process in which one has extra fields that are heavy at least, you know, up to say this scale, um, and which coupled to the inflaton, so their mass is a function of the inflaton by, and as a result of that, there's some non-adiabatic particle projection, um, and there's basically a component of the resulting scalar perturbations that comes from Bremsstrahlung long off the production event. Um, so that part of the shape has a very simple and factorized form, which enables uh, data analysis. And in fact, recently, Munchmeyer, Munchmeyer and Kendrick Smith worked out the optimal estimator for this um, and applied it to WMAP data so far. Um, this also has the property of reasons that I won't explain in detail today that 
it it signal to noise gets gets better within up to a certain point um, and and so that that opens up this uh, arena of studying uh, even observationally such higher endpoint functions um, the but this bothered me in the sense that I described this so far as a particular contribution to the shape of the non gaussianity that is contained in in the kind of effects that I've sketched here where it was um, independent of Remster long uh, diagrams if you wish um, but the, this, the full theory involved here um, involves uh, axions, which have lots of interaction vertices, and those proliferate with factorial enhancements all over the place on the face of it. So um, this raised for me this much more broad question of um, what other contributions would there be? In this problem, the shapes are generally um, much more um, complicated than this this function, this momentum space correlator that I've quoted here that, that factorizes a momentum space. Um, and instead, there are sort of hybrids of various uh, sinusoidal um, functions of various uh, subsums of momenta. And um, those could be large, and we would be none the wiser because uh, there's some computational limitation on, on analyzing those. So, um, there's, in this sense, a lot to explore in terms of high point correlation functions and their observational prospects. Um, so, and so Eva, I, this uh, signal to noise ratio of the yes. three point function by the two point function, is it so? Uh, that's right. So, this is just an illustration of how it can get stronger with, with the n of the you know, end point function. Um, which is which is not the um, naive expectation or the familiar thing. So it turns out this extends beyond just three to two, uh, and there's some some shape in, of this uh, signal to noise as a function of n that peaks at some n depending on these parameters um, having to do with some some axion physics. Okay. So yeah, so it's you know this is a particular scenario. It's a fairly you know it's a reasonably well motivated scenario from from um, and high what energy is PB? Is it an effective sound speed or something like that? Sorry, where there's no effect. This where, where, C sub CB. No, yeah. no, no. It's uh, no. It's it's um, it's it's just some parameter in the model. Uh, so I'm not I'm not really explaining it today. But it's it's just some parameter in the model. It's not okay. a sound speed. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So, um, okay, so today I'm going to focus on this multi-field context. Um, I want to, again, think very generally at first and then, then commit to some very explicit model space where we can analyze in detail. So I'd like to keep the big picture in mind always. So let me, let me stay that way for one more slide. So um, suppose we, stack the deck in favor of um, sort of boring Gaussian uh, probabilities, meaning we, we start with a product state uh, that's Gaussian for both delta phi and the, the extra fields chi um, with you know, the usual covariance that you have in, in inflation. Um, here I'm taking this chi to also be light, just to, just to be simple. Um, and, and then, you know, let's say we do have some mixing interaction that we allow and, and we ask what is the effect of that. So being very, very general, you know, there's some state we started with. If we make the sudden approximation, then we can evolve that just as we do always in quantum mechanics, um, obtaining a new state that uh, evolves with a Hamiltonian um, with coefficients that are obtained in this way. And then we obtain a density matrix uh, by by taking this combination. Um, and if you know we work in uh, over time scales where we, we don't resolve the you know um, if we work in this regime, <laughs> um, then it, it collapses to the diagonal here. Um, and I think you know it's natural to expect this to 
be a highly mixed state generically and could easily have a strong tail in, um, once we integrate over chi, could have a strong tail in delta phi. Um, here I'm not adding any real content except to, just to say that this question about the strength of the tail uh, of the distribution has you know this this general form and in order to avoid a non-gaussian tail you'd have to uh, make very special choices here it seems um, so it, it's kind of related to the growth of entanglement in other words in a in a um, in a quantum state which is a subject of interest in other areas of physics these days so um, now let me let me come back, come, come down to Earth and talk about some specific scenario just to be concrete. So we have uh, some second, some additional light field chi, I put vectors actually to allow for some number of those. Um, and let's consider the scenario we just started with um, where they interact separately for a long time or they evolve separately and then they interact through some mixing, um, some mixing interaction. So here I'm going to consider a particular form of a mixing interaction that um, respects what was some approximate shift symmetry in phi, but allows any um, behavior in chi, um, and expand that around the background evolution of the field phi. Um, so that way we get this phi dot, delta phi dot here. Now the, the latter, um, to anticipate a little bit is the field momentum. And so we'll get a, a nice way to understand the evolution that uh, we get from this, this mixing interaction in a Hamiltonian language. Um, when it comes to this f of chi, you know, you could take different, it could take different forms starting from just a dimension six operator of this form up to some um, say exponential form. And the latter is motivated by the, the form of a hyperbolic field space geometry. So this is something that people have studied um, for many you know, different ways. Um, recently, Kalish and Linde and Brown have uh, particularly stud um, been interested in this sort of geometry. Um, and the sensitivities that I mentioned uh, in the exponent will in part come from here in these models. So um, here's the uh, mixing interaction again in Hamiltonian language in terms of the field momentum. Um, the free part of the Hamiltonian is very subdominant because of the, the usual evolution factors. Um, and over, say, a sufficiently small time window, um, you know, which we're quite precise about in the papers, the um, evolution is then you know, in quant just as in quantum mechanics always, it's in e to the minus ih delta t, and it um, this del this mixing Hamiltonian is a you know linear in the field momentum. So this is a shift generator in field space. So it takes the wave function that we had and it shifts the delta phi piece of it. Um, so if we um, started with some wave function for chi, which could be whatever, whatever we want at this stage, uh, then under this step of evolution, it gets mixed with delta phi um, in a way that is easy to calculate. And uh, now this f of chi appears inside the Gaussian function, um, psi Gaussian of, of delta phi plus this f of chi. So, okay, we'll keep track of this parameter kappa that's appearing, it's phi bar dot delta, delta t. Um, oh, Eva? So yes. At this moment, do you have assumed that this delta phi and chi both are massless? So here I um, actually haven't assumed anything about the chi because I, I'm, I'm allowing it at the moment to have this, um, you know, this uh, general form. Um, but yeah, um, I have taken this oh, to be the leading because you have written a free Hamiltonian. That's why I asked. Oh, 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 oh. yeah, yeah, no, no, you, you're, you're right. Um, but, um, right. So what we're using here is that the mixing interaction dominates during this Delta T. Um, that's okay. 
Okay. Yeah, so first, that this is the mixing interaction and that it dominates. That, that's that's okay. the content here. Um, yeah. Yeah, you're, yeah you're, you're right. Here, here I. Uh, uh, hello. Uh, may I ask a question? Please, uh, please, so, please ask. Please ask. So, what is the physics behind this sudden approximation? Like, why is the mixing happening at a, at a small time window? Like, what kind of um, um, this might be responsible for something like that, or is it? Uh, yeah, yeah. So the um, one reason to consider that is reheating uh, tends to introduce. So in, during the exit from inflation is one place where this sort of thing can can happen naturally at a short over a relatively short time period. Um, in other words, uh, the whole inflationary paradigm involves you know the inflationary phase and then some kind of exit which involves transition from this pristine inflation phase down to uh, the somewhat more complicated later cosmological evolution that we have and there are many ways that that can work um, but the uh, but one typically models that through some kind of interactions that I mean I'm, I'm being very general but uh, there are interactions that rather quickly uh, take the field down to um, you know, away from this potential dominated phase and um, that can involve lots of interactions that happen over a relatively quick time. So that's uh, one thing, one motivation to have in mind for this. Um, in fact, it can happen at any time, you know, it just, it's just a, um, it's just a, uh, that would be just sort of an extra possibility to put it at some other time. But, but the exit from inflation is a, is a, you know, reasonable uh, time window in which you expect new new kinds of interactions to apply. Um, okay, thanks. And, yeah, and no problem. And, and in part, what we're doing, so we have two interests here. One is this formal question, and the other is observations. So for the formal question, we also just want to um, set something up, which is, you know, part of the physics of some, you know, gen in some generic um, picture. So th the general, uh, setup or um, formulas would be back here on this slide with whatever mixing uh, at whatever time you want. Um, but the um, we want to get a little specific so that we can answer the formal question very, very simply. So uh, for that, it's, it's just kind of um, nice to have this simple uh, step of evolution that we can really get our hands around, get our hands on. So. Um, yeah, so that's that's really the other motivation here. Okay, so um, within this, within this, uh, definitely you know more specific uh, parameter space of quantum fields that we've just discussed. Um, there's still a lot of freedom. There's a lot of parameters uh, in there. There's the potential V of chi and the mixing interaction F of chi. Um, and so within, you know, this framework, the non-Gaussianity that we're interested in could come from, you know, one or both of those. Uh, what we'll see is that it, it arises even for a purely Gaussian sector here, so V of chi being boring, um, and uh, just from some f of chi, um, so including this mixing. Another aspect of this more generally is that the chi sector itself could be highly nonlinear. Um, it, that could be captured by the stochastic methods of Bohn, Starbinsky et al., et cetera. Um, and there one has this beautiful formalism of a, of a Fokker Planck equation describing the drift and diffusion on the field landscape. Um, so in, in that context, one can derive a one point PDF, which is, which is quite simple. It's at equilibrium, there's um, a one point PDF, which is up to some normalization, the um, exponential of minus the potential basically in, in Hubble units. Okay, so um, we'll play with sort of both aspects of this. Um, let me explain now where this heavy tail will come from. Um, again, first introducing the basic idea. Uh, so we have this probability distribution. 
Um, we want to integrate over chi in this path integral. We now have understood that it's in this context it's given by this convolution. And so there was this Gaussian suppression, psi Gaussian of delta phi, which would give the standard Gaussian suppression of the tail. Um, but right now, we, at, at this point, we see that this F mix can come around and, and cancel that. So if, if we look at field configurations within this path integral such that F mix uh, goes like minus delta phi uh, over kappa here, um, then that Gaussian suppression is canceled. And the question then becomes, what price are we paying in this other factor? Um, and the price we're paying there um, uh, you know, might vary by model, but the question, that is the question at this point. And we'll see that this can um, easily have a, uh, say if we, for, to be a little more specific, we, we find a saddle point configuration of this um, chi, uh, then evaluating this factor on that saddle point, the question becomes, you know, does that as a function of delta phi, as a functional of delta phi, does it have a heavier than Gaussian tail or not? Um, okay. So let's, let's look at this, um, say, working with the generators of disconnected and connected correlators, um, which is the standard uh, expression. Um, but now applying it in our framework, we have this, this path integral to do. Um, and indeed, if we calculate this e to the w of j object, there's, there's a delta phi uh, functional integral in here, which we can do for the shifted Gaussian. We can just, we can just do that. Um, and that uh, is trivial, and it gives us this expression as an integral over chi, which is still got this, this general factor of psi perp of chi hanging around. Um, times this uh, this exponential of of uh, e to the minus kappa j f of chi. Um, so that's where we are so far. Um, and working with that object for say even just a purely Gaussian chi sector. So if I now specialize to to where this psi perp is is Gaussian and where everything about the chi sector is Gaussian then um, and including this mixing um, of course the combination of the f of chi with the phi dot squared in, in that term is is not um, is not linear but for chi it's all this gaussian we can just do it so the uh, the result of that in the full quantum field theory um, is is given here for w of j and its derivatives and one finds explicitly that the factorial persists okay so that um, is true of this of this particular case. Um, but um, of course, we want to know how general that is. Um, let me say a few words about this uh, case where we have a non-trivial evolution in the chi sector, um, which is governed by the uh, Starobinsky et al. stochastic Falcon Planck equation. Um, so um, again, I expect that you heard things about this from Leonardo last week. Um, I'm just you. writing, you, you did, great, great. Okay, so here's the equation for the one point PDF. Um, it takes this standard and beautiful form of a fucker planck equation. Um, and um, the approach to equilibrium is dictated by eigenfunctions of this of this operator. Um, so that depends on v of chi. Um, and you know there's details in what these values are in different cases. Um, but in any case, again, however long it takes to get there, one can easily compute the equilibrium one point PDF and things like the two point correlation function. Um, we did some more explicit calculations with a linear view of chi in one of our papers for this and, and other quantities. Um, uh, for example, a two-point um, PDF with uh, very different values for the field at, at nearby points. Um, Ima, uh, yes. Here you have defined something called effective potential. Okay. So 
when you have written the total differential operator appearing in the left side uh, and you are writing that uh, you are factorizing in terms of v is is this okay here you have assumed something oh okay 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 yeah yeah, yeah. sorry 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 <laughs> okay it's a very simple question i have asked okay no 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 okay you can proceed that's okay okay thanks yeah, yeah, um, okay. Yeah, you, you can find beautiful calculations of this nature in the in the paper by uh, Yokoyama and Starbinsky. Um, okay, okay, sure, sure, sure. Um, okay, so so this one point PDF is highly nonlinear, just as a, as a function of v uh, in general. Um, and so if we focus on that quantity um, and apply that uh, physics to it. Then this psi perp squared that I that I described earlier, um, you know, becomes this e to the minus v basically, and the um, other factor is sitting here. And now we're we're working with one point PDFs and we're doing an ordinary integral, um, and you know we can, as you, as you might imagine, we'll get into a little more detail, but we can easily assess this uh, in terms of what the shape of the tail is of this histogram. Um, so this will help us a lot with the formal um, analysis of the fate of this factorial. It, uh, when it comes to the observational applications, it has to be treated very, very carefully. It doesn't just directly apply. Um, one has to smooth the field over some scale to get results that have to do with, say, uh, primordial black hole production. When it comes to um, trying to understand the histogram itself, um, Again, the factorial by itself is not enough. It's, it's, the, it's the probability at which the tail emerges that matters. So I'll get there. But as far as the formal structure goes, um, the idea is to work with a histogram. Um, the path integral uh, for these various quantities becomes a, simple, becomes a simple integral. So if we work with these generating functionals, uh, it, it's the same thing I had before, but now expressed as an ordinary integral. Um, and to establish whether or not um, the factorial uh, persists, well, we can analyze that using some basic um, analysis. So we ask uh, if, if we're in the, a situation where we can work, we're working around some point where we can tailor expand Z of J and W of J, um, then we do that and, and then the correlators are obtained by the, you know, say big N derivatives with respect to J and so um, the, those bring down a factorial. So the question of avoiding the factorial enhancement would be, um, so you would avoid the factorial enhancement of those correlators if these coefficients in these expansions um, themselves die like a factorial. Okay, so that is what it would be required to avoid the factorial enhancement of the correlators. And, you know, well, when is that true? If it's true if the function is entire, <laughs> But having an entire function is not is not the generic case. So um, we'll get into slightly more specifics, but that's really the point. Um, so um, let's suppose we do all this, and now uh, we analyze this integral uh, via a saddle point. Um, so that means we you know we vary the exponent, we find the the um, the saddle point from that. Um, and then uh, we think about the situation where we can tailor expand everybody around some point. Um, and um, we, uh, of course, then have a W of J, which is the exponent evaluated at that saddle. Um, and putting all this together, we get this, this formula in particular. Um, so we can, we can relate the expansion of this F in terms of the expansion of W and the fate of the n factorial and the correlators. So um, um, this is getting a little bit um, silly with specificity, but for example, if you take uh, just a linear F, mixing F, and you um, apply um, this formula, then you get that J is V prime uh, just here, because this is a constant. Um, we can then, um, ask about df dj, uh, which, is, which is then um, d chi star dj, 
or one over dj d chi star um, and that um, quantity would go to infinity if j prime is over zero and that here corresponds to v double prime being zero um, so if that happens anywhere um, anywhere in the complex plane then the um, then this is just not um, this is not uh, going to be entire because this this expansion is blowing up um, so that is just a kind of silly special <laughs> specific <laughs> demonstration of um, how uh, generic it is not to have the, this function be entire. Another way this can happen is if we can't actually tailor expand, but say, for example, if this z of j as a function of j has a zero, well, then w of j has a branch cut and is not entire, and the connected correlators have the n factorial enhancement. So that's another way to look at it. And here and in the paper, we, we played with some demonstration of that. Um, Okay, so given given that, let's get a little more quantitative and, and ask, you know, okay, what what does the tail of the distribution look like? Uh, these fact, these correlators are are showing this enhancement, um, but what about the um, more practical applications um, that will uh, uh, that we want to understand, um, which relate to you know the the details of how it's behaving on the tail. Uh, okay, so um, again, you know, one can, this is the general formula in this, in this class of models. Uh, one can then get more specific to work with it um, in detail. And so, for example, we might take these uh, chi of p sort of directions in field space that, that again are motivated quite well from the top down. Um, and then, um, play with some parameter that, uh, that interpolates from, say, the chi, chi or chi squared that we talked about above, all the way to this exponential, which is, a, which is actually a natural possibility. Um, Eva? Yeah, yeah. Was, hi, Sonia. Yeah. Is the potential only a function of phi or phi and chi? So is the mixing only through the kinetic term, or is also mixing in the potential? Here we, we are focusing on the mixing in the kinetic term. Um, so yeah, of course there could be more general, much more general um, models <laughs> for sure. So th there is nonlinearity coming from both, both parts, but um, the mixing we took to be that, that particular um, uh, kinetic term mixing. And you know, one could say words about the mixing preserving the some shift symmetry in phi by itself. Uh, and then, you know, the, the, the simplest example I gave up, uh, before would be uh, such a model where we allowed the first, um, you know, operator that, that is consistent with that, that couples the two. So, um, okay. Thank yeah, you. But, but yeah, this is, no, thanks for the question. This is not, um, you know, meant to be a completely general analysis. That would be, you know, um, yeah, yeah, no, I understand it. I just wanted to understand. No, no, no. It's 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 a good it's a good question. It's um, you know, um, obviously the kind of question that's very relevant for how seriously to take some some particular model or whatever. But um, uh, but yeah, we're kind of here trying to do two things at once, which is assess this formal question and then also think about the, the application. So yeah, I mean. I do like thinking about the general quantum field theory problem, but then it just reverts to this, you know, huge path, path interval, which will no doubt generate entanglement in all sorts of ways, and um, it's it's hard to compute in general. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, no, I imagine. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, okay. No, no. Thank you. Um, so um, yeah, so here we kind of play around with something that is quite unappealing to to take this chi to the m and very m but the the end point of that particular um sequence of models is actually something that is quite appealing and you know quote unquote natural which is this hyperbolic field space so for sort of formal purposes of understanding um what this all means we'll, we'll consider this this particular sequence uh but with the with the understanding that the point of the larger and larger m is really to to capture the physics of this exponential model. One could just, in fact, do, do both ends of this and forget about those words. 
Um, anyway, we, we just we have to get specific to do something uh, explicit. Uh, okay, so anyway, so if we take this, oh, uh, I just yeah. uh, want to ask one question. Maybe I'm just um, confused about something. So if you have a lot of fields, yeah. uh, shouldn't you expect that some kind of um, mean field approximation or something would be uh, better valid? I mean, uh, I, I'm just uh, trying to understand. Um, how to square that intuition with uh, what you're saying. Like, like shouldn't we couple to some kind of single trace degrees of freedom or something like that? Like, or uh, rephrase it in terms of that. Um, or am I? Uh, well, let's see. So you have in mind, um, so which quantity are you, are you thinking about computing, first of all? And what, um, when you say mean field, do you mean you have in mind a, um, some, so say, some kind of say, say go ahead sorry uh, sorry uh, say I, I'm just interested in like uh, correlators of uh, this delta phi uh -huh, and yes. how it is affected by uh, this mixing yes. and uh, let's say the sky is some um, I'm just trying to think of the sky as some kind of a large theory um, which uh, you know like and, and faced with that we usually kind of Try to move to some single trace uh, degrees of freedom, some average thing, and then uh, mm -hmm. order or one by n uh, things there. But uh, but that's not what you're doing. Um, well, I'll, I'll get to something a bit like that a bit later. So uh, we will consider for certain purposes a large flavor expansion at some point. Um, uh, so that goes in the direction that you're asking, I think. Okay. So but but the fluctuations are suppressed, uh, right? You know, like if you have many many fields, in some sense. Uh, you can treat it, uh, you know, classically much more. Ah, so you, um, is that intuition correct, or uh, uh, am I am I thinking about it wrong? Um, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, in this setting, we're we're already treating it um, classically, stochastically, for the um, reason yeah. that, yeah. So. Uh, so but you're kind of asking, you're kind of asking for something beyond that, and I um, uh, let's see. I would yeah, I would need to think about it more. But I mean, I think that this um, analysis of Sarbinsky would would still apply with all these fields, and just for the one point PDF, for example, it just gives this, um, if I'm not mistaken. So, um, but would stochastic fluctuations also be one by n suppressed or. Uh, I mean, uh, let's say, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, so that, that's a question of this two-point function uh, here and how it behaves as a function of n, um, right? Yeah, um, there is, you know, there is some um, dependence there. We actually, if, if you look in the paper on the um, primordial black hole production from this stuff, uh, there, there is a factor of nf there. I, I didn't Put it here because I was kind of writing down for one field, but um, uh, there are NF factors there, and they definitely enter into the analysis. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I don't know what more to say at this level, but yes, the NFs appear, <laughs> and they do simplify things, um, but also contribute to, yeah, to, to the, um, you know, the, they contribute to effects that kind of go both ways when it comes to making applications of this. I, I'm, so I, I don't know. I, I can answer you in some some generality that you can work usefully here with a large flavor expansion. We did do a bit of that. Um, um, yes. yeah. yeah. I mean, I think may, maybe what you're getting at is some sort of central limit theorem where you expect the physics of the other sector to be to be Gaussian or something. And I'm not sure that that is valid. So if that's, I'm not. I don't mean to put words in your mouth, but. Um, um, yeah, I, I was thinking of something like that, but you're saying that's not, that's uh, too naive uh, for some reason. Well, um, let's go see some variables. Yeah, some average single trace variables. Uh. Well, yeah, I mean, um, but I think it's all kind of in front of us, so um, you know. Um, Yeah, I guess I'm not seeing immediately how that would uh, contradict this. Th this has an extreme amount of non-Gaussianity, right? So, um, 
at least at the moment, I'm not seeing how that that um, gets gets removed by a large number. But uh, I mean, depending on the shape of this bee, um, this is a very non-Gaussian PDF. Uh, but yeah, no, it's a good thing to get um, more intuition for. So let, let me just continue with this um, little estimation of the tail behavior. So uh, if we do do this business of, you know, basically, basically there is a saddle point where this F wants to cancel the otherwise uh, extreme Gaussian suppression. And then um, plugging that in here gives a uh, tail behavior that goes like e to the minus delta phi uh, to the P over M. Um, in this kind of silly family models. Um, so if P over M is small, smaller than two, then this beats the Gaussian uh, at some point. So, um, and in particular, when effectively M has gone to infinity, you get just, you know, something like a log squared in the exponent instead of uh, any, any, any power. So it's uh, very, very heavy in that case. Um, so that's what I'm saying just here. Um, and in order to make any kind of application of this, as I was saying at the beginning, one needs to know not just the shape here, but also, you know, at what value of the, of the excursion of delta phi or ultimately zeta in cosmology, you know, what, what value of that, um, the value of that where the, where the tail starts to exceed the Gaussian one, you know, what is the overall probability? And if you had some number of data points, you know, you, in order to uh, make something of that observationally, you would need that probability to be bigger than one over the square root of, of n, uh, n points. So um, furthermore, you, you have to ask, what do you mean? Um, at what value of your parameters do you ask that question? And that's uh, indicated here. So where the parameters lie at the, uh, two-point function bound um, on corrections that this would induce in, in the two-point correlation function, uh, that's where um, you can work and then ask whether there's, at that point, uh, there's information in the tail or not, and that's where this, this um, that's, that, then this, this inequality is the correct uh, comparison. Okay, so you can also get more sophisticated, work with the relative entropies and between different distributions and so on. Um, and that um, leads one to a, a very clear preference for um, different um, preferred endpoint functions depending on, on these model parameters. So in particular, it can be, you know, can very much favor higher end. Uh, and in other cases, it can still favor the two-point function, the low-point correlation function. Um, so let me um, say a little bit more about what I meant about uh, the regime of validity of the stochastic um, de um, description, the, the equilibrium distribution coming out of the stochastic analysis. So um, <clears throat> if one wants to apply that, uh, one has to be careful about the various scales. Um, so we have some scale of the observed universe. We have the scale of, um, well, the resolution of one's experiment. Um, and one has the scale of the correlation length as computed in the stochastic uh, uh, description. And, you know, in order to have, um, you know, the, the correct inequalities that there's some uh, that that is, uh, you know, above the resolution, say, and that it is um, still smaller than, you know, so that you have multiple patches in, in the observed universe, that gives you a certain window on these um, eigenvalues, lambda, um, in particular the lowest one, lambda one, um, that, that we talked about earlier, which govern the approach to equilibrium. So these, uh, these, um, you know, this can, this can hold, but Say if uh, the the resolution, say for the CMB, um, you know we have ten E foldings or so. Um, there, this window isn't very large, so it you know it's it exists, but it's um, you know depending on your point of view, it's not 
it's not appealing from the sort of model building point of view um, because of this uh, very specific value of essentially the couplings that, that would be needed for this. Um, but the mixing by itself, in any case, gives, gives a big effect. So it doesn't really matter whether one is in this regime in order to um, obtain these heavy tails. Um, uh, and, and also, um, I should say, when it comes to PBHs, uh, primordial black holes, the delta NE is much larger and the window is much larger. So in that context, um, what I said on the previous slide isn't really a, much of a limitation, but there's still um, something to consider, which has to do with the following. So if you have, starting from some origin, uh, so in, in the context of pr production of primordial black holes, what one needs, I should say first, is, is a large excursion of the field over a scale that is limited, uh, that ultimately uh, dictates the mass of the black hole. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it, it's not enough to have some probability for large zeta somewhere in the, in the map. Um, one needs this, this kind of shape, <laughs> this kind of... Um, enormous excursion over some finite range of, of scales. Um, and so if you had some large excursion and then you do this stochastic drift with fluctuations, well, you have a net drift this way if you have some inward um, pointing potential. And then, you know, you might as well just mix right away rather than trying to um, get some nonlinearity from the stochastic evolution. On the other hand, if you jump, say, over to a place where the potential drifts outward, then the excursion gets bigger and bigger through those effects. And so that uh, seems uh, like it could enhance the non-Gaussianity coming from the chi sector by itself. Um, but even there, one has to be a bit careful because these, these eigenvalues are, are affected by that. So one would have to make sure it all, it all hangs together. In any case, the mixing alone <laughs> um, leads to these heavy tails. So with that application, let me just quickly state um, the, the uh, connection. So, you know, we have this distribution. It corresponds pretty directly to an abundance of primordial black holes. Um, and the, the mass is then related to the evolved um, scale of this excursion. Um, and one has to impose that the two-point function is not, is not affected. And here I put factors of the flavor number. Um, uh, that we were talking about a bit earlier, um, where they go in the two-point function, and we have to, you know, insist that that not be affected while at the same time we produce the black holes. Um, and those constraints are easy to satisfy altogether. Um, we worked with a large flavor to make sure we had um, rated of stability from the model point of view um, here in this very simple model, which I should have said um, has, you know, these Gaussian values for V and for F of chi. Um, but, um, you know, we can work on this much more generally. And in fact, another example that is also radiatively stable would be this hyperbolic field space where we get, um, where we get, uh, where we get uh, the very heavy tail that I quoted earlier. So, um, Wherever it went, yeah, this this tail. So, um, long story short, you know, you, you get a, a viable PBH production mechanism, and I want to stress that this is not uh, something where one kind of tuned to get a huge spike in in Gaussian perturbations at some you know point in the process to get uh, black holes of a of a corresponding scale. Um, so, um, I think this. Adds, adds a bit of, to the theoretical motivation for primordial black holes, although, you know, there's nothing about astrophysics that forces us to that in any, in any sense. Um, let me, the last thing I want to share with you is something that's coming up. So um, we worked at large flavor number for radio stability, um, and in analyzing that, um, we, you know, calculated the loop effects and at large flavor number, the one loop contribution dominates as, as is hopefully familiar uh -huh. from 
uh, similar quantum field theory problems with large flavors. And so we can calculate that explicitly. We integrate out chi at the Gaussian level, and we get something that's a bit reminiscent of a Coleman-Weinberg potential, except here we had an interaction involving phi dot squared. So um, we can flip the signs around, um, and for different applications, we want different signs here. Um, and in fact, if we take a, a, a different sign from what we had in this uh, analysis of primordial black holes, um, then we get a logarithmic term from this one loop effect, uh, which enforces a speed limit on the scalar field motion. So this is, this is something we've seen before. We saw it in DBI inflation with a square root. And here we, we're encountering a logarithmic branch cut where um, we similarly find that it uh, forces the field to not move faster than a certain, certain value. Um, automatically through the through the dynamics, um, regardless of how steep the potential energy function is. So, um, you know, here's a few more details of this. I've gone over time already, so I won't go through it, and it's um, you know still being written up. In any case, um, but I think it's you know a lot of fun. It's in some sense you know nothing too new since we have seen this movie before. Um, but these examples where one can you know, put together a resummed function of the of the uh, phi dot squared, or generally this d phi squared that appears in the p of x uh, context. It's not, it's, you know, it's not very often that there's really been a calculation of those that um, resums them uh, in a clear way. So I find this uh, amusing, at, at least that we find another one with a branch cut that imposes a speed limit. And so we can analyze that and find inflation again on steep potentials and so on. And we expect uh, similar phenomenology with a collateral non-Gaussianity in this case as well. So um, I've gone on a bit too long. Let me just summarize. Um, the bunny's name was Zeta. And the summary of the talk is sometimes you can see her tail, as you can also see from these images. Um, more seriously, uh, let me just leave you with this uh, proper summary of, of the physics. Uh -huh. And uh, I'm happy to stop for some more questions if anybody has them. Eva, can you go back to the previous slide? I just want to take a photo of that. <laughs> yeah, it's really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's the most interesting thing here, right? <laughs> no. So, um, yeah, Eva had given a very nice talk. It's uh, really detailed. Now, I know that all, a lot of people have asked already some questions. Now, if you want to ask more questions, you feel free to ask. So because this is the discussion session, you can continue the discussion. So I would request all the other viewers and listeners, please, you can ask questions right now. Um, Eva. Eva. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So I, I'm not sure you understood this. So this effect appears regardless of the value of n flavor. I mean, you just need one that depends on the potential. I mean, you had a table at some point, and it went very fast where you were comparing the uh. the p. I mean, what are? I guess the 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 short question is, what are the values of and flavor. How many extra fields do you need to have these effects? Yeah, that's the table, the one you had. No. Uh, right. I should. I should. Yeah. I went fast because I felt like I was repeating myself. But the um, the um, okay. What the, what this table is 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 the um, is analyzing whether there is information on the tail that that is uh you know more is is the tail more informative does it have a bigger relative entropy say than um the corresponding two point function estimators in comparing you know this model against the null hypothesis of the gaussian model here we're not really using the large flavor expansion at all we're just um uh doing we, this could have been with a single chi field um the the um so when we, when I, I should be very, very clear, of course, here, when I say endpoint function, I'm not talking about N, NF at all. This is the N of the, how many, you know, points in the function we how have. How many points you have, okay. 
yeah, yeah. So uh, by best end there, we just mean, you know, who has the biggest signal to noise. Uh, yeah. So, so this um, just refers to the correlator that you're computing. It has nothing yeah, to do with exactly, that. Yeah, this is exactly. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Okay, thank um, you. I had missed that. that. No, that's okay. Thanks. Sorry that that was um, unclear. No question. More question. Please mm, ask. Hello. Uh, this is Nitin from India. Uh, okay. Actually, I have a very simple question. Can you uh, please go back to the like the first slide where you had this formula for the tree level uh, summation amplitudes? Okay, sure. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. So uh, it appears that this formula is not applicable to the cases where, like for example, you have a particle that is scattering of a potential. So like one-to-one -one scattering from a potential, right? Uh, right, this is this is about large n. Uh, okay. One to so, many, one to many, yes. Okay, okay, that's it, thank you. Thanks for the question. Yeah. Any more? Who no. wants to ask question, please ask. Yeah, uh, hi, uh, so, uh, Eva, I just wanted to come back to this discussion about this central limit theorem and so on. I think okay. uh, you, you answered it with, uh, with, the, with the rest of the talk, but I just wanted to make sure that I understood the answer. Uh, so the statement is that when you have very fat tails, when you have distributions with very fat tails, uh, it is possible that you don't get something like a central limit theorem, right? You know, like, um, uh, so at least uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit familiar with it in this context of uh, Brownian motion where you draw distributions uh, with fat tails and then you you don't get diffusion um, you get something like super diffusion or anomalous diffusion as as uh, as people call it in uh, statistical mechanics uh, so so the kind of um, uh, models that you're considering um, do you understand that right that there 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 are, there are some cosmological analogs of uh, similar things that that there's some uh, there's some distributions with fat tails from which you draw, um, you know, like your uh, noise or something. And then uh, as a result, um, what you're having is that somehow these tails, first of all, matter. And second of all, you know, like uh, the central limit theorem intuitions are kind of misleading. Um, uh, you know, like, can I understand what you're saying in that, uh, that sense or, uh, or am I uh, not understanding it right? Um, let's see. So, I mean, there, there's an aspect, I, I want to be careful. I'm not completely sure that, um, that what you said maps directly onto this. Um, it's, I mean, it's not, the words could map. I'm just not totally sure if it addresses the, where did this go? I mean, so the question the question you were asking really was about um, what happens at large enough, um, and say in he in this very simple model we can just calculate everything as a function of NF, um, and in particular we can calculate the tail. We get you know something from that. Uh, the that does not match the central limit theorem. Uh, is that uh, well, um, I mean, I mean, it, yeah, it, in order to get to the central limit theorem, you have to have enough samples, right? So, so there's something related to what you're asking that does a, a appear in this problem, which is that if you, if you calculate the the naive signal to noise ratio for the endpoint functions in these models, you find that in all cases, that appears to give an enormous uh, advantage to these high endpoint functions. Um, so if you, in particular, if you do, um, you know, the standard estimator for the large endpoint function and you, um, uh, so you calculate the, um, um, you know, the, basically the squared quantity that, that corresponds to the signal to noise for, for a given n. Um, 
let's say, signal to Gaussian noise, um, then you end up you know, with, an, with an answer that is factorial enhanced. Okay, so for some a little time, we were over interpreting that and thinking it was telling us that there was a universal advantage. Um, but in that context, it, there's not, and it's related to the failure of the central limit theorem. It has to do with um, not really having enough independent samples and having the distribution or the estimator uh, itself being very non-Gaussian. So in other words, signal to noise where noise means just the width of the distribution was a, was a misleading guide to the, to, the, uh, to the information content and the high endpoint functions. In, in, on this page, we're doing it properly. We just do a bunch of Monte Carlos and we um, back out you know, what, where the information is and what the best endpoint function is. So, but if you ask the question, what about the um, signal to noise uh, as defined as, you know, um, the, basically the squared value of the endpoint function divided by the Gaussian width, uh, you get, you know, you, you just, you get something huge in all cases. And, and the resolution of that, of that discrepancy is that, um, for, for those quantities, the central limit theorem is, you know, you haven't reached it, you haven't reached it. So, um, but I think you're asking about something a little bit different, having to do with whether um, the effects of this lar these large NF um, fields somehow average out. And yeah, I'm not sure what the most direct answer to you is. It's just that I'm saying here, we can calculate very explicitly and, and that, you know, the, it doesn't uh, remove the non-Gaussianity from the combined, I mean, from the mixing effect in particular. So, so um, uh, part of what's going on here is we also, you know, set this up with a, with a, if you like, an ONF symmetry. So there's a lot of symmetry in the problem, and maybe that um, uh, also goes against this more generic intuition. So I, I'm not totally sure. Um, if you want, you know, the, the papers that this is based on have lots of uh, explicit calculations so you can trace through what, what happened if you wish. Um, I don't want to jump to too much of a conclusion about the, <laughs> about the words though. So, um, so Loga, you want to comment on that something? No, no, just, just, just one more question. And then I, I just, uh, uh, you know, like uh, so th this, I mean, um, the kind of things, um, that happen at least in the statistical mechanics uh, models and you know like in the Brownian motion and so on yeah. is that you know like uh, when people consider uh, uh, there's certain things called levy flights and so on and so forth where uh, which are not quite you know like diffusive uh, they're not quite um, described by standard Gaussian kind of um, uh, you know like diffusion um, you know, like I was wondering whether there is an um, analogous statement in these kind of models that you're considering that, you know, like, uh, um, like usually, you know, like when you have a distribution which doesn't, whose higher moments don't exist um, or, or, or something like that, you know, like uh, usually, you know, like they have some very interesting uh, behavior when you think about, uh, you know, the Fokker Planck equations and and so yeah, yeah no, that, that can definitely happen as well. I know what you mean. I think that, you know, certainly the, the probability can be normalized and the, still the endpoint functions can diverge. Is that, that's what you have in mind? Yes, yes, yeah. Yeah, so the higher, okay. uh, then of course the central limit theorem does, you know, it's not applicable because the central limit theorem uh, assumes that all the higher moments exist and are finite and so on and so forth for the, for the seed distribution, which then uh, repeat. Right. Uh, but, yeah, uh, that's so, just so if, saying, that's interesting. That that isn't what's going on in in these models in the in, in the sense that the endpoint function. I mean, maybe maybe for some of them it would, but for like I, I wrote down this, um, you know, rather large parameter space of models and to only analyze some you know examples. But uh, in the ones we analyzed, it wasn't that the endpoint functions themselves don't exist. Um, so it was more like an intermediate situation. But anyway, keep going, please. Yeah, okay. I was just thinking whether there's some relation or any, has anybody thought about uh, you know, relation oh. between this uh, maybe flight models and... and can, you say, can you say again the term you're using? Uh, I'm just not catching it. Uh, so it's it's Levy, Levy, yes, I'm sorry, I might mean, like uh, maybe flight. Uh, I just put it in the chat, but... Uh, 
Oh, in the chat. Okay, let me find the chat. Uh, yeah. So, uh, I mean, it's just just one of these models which are not like. Uh, yeah. That'd be fine. Okay, got it. Yeah, so, yeah, that's a, that's an interesting comment. I'll try. I'll I can look. I can look into that. I I don't know offhand. Okay. But okay, yeah, no, thank, no, thank you. No, it's a very interesting comment. I I don't. So yeah. Loga, what what this model corresponds to? Can you can you speak a little bit? If you want. Well, it just corresponds to some large deviation. I mean, like it's like some random motion, but some some the the, the random walker kind of sometimes take a takes a large step. Okay. And so you know, like uh, that's roughly the uh, the kind of microscopic model, and then you kind of try to write down some Walker Planck equation, and, and and the continuum model is not given by a Gaussian thing, you know, like uh, yeah. Because this, these large steps, the rare large steps, the tails of the distribution kind of, uh, you know, destroy the, uh, the universal long time diffusion equation. So you don't get a, a at long distances you don't get a diffusion equation, but you get some other more uh, interesting behavior. But, uh, um, yeah. Anyway, but 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 uh, yeah, maybe maybe it is. Uh, uh, yeah. I was just wondering whether it's relevant to what you're talking about. Maybe anyway, uh, thanks for the talk. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thanks for the discussion. Uh, any other questions do you guys have? If not, then uh, we all uh, have to clap for Eva for giving such a such an excellent talk. And uh, yeah, so uh, I know that Again, I'm saying that we, we are not in a good situation, everyone. But yeah, like Eva can made it. Uh, she agreed to give the talk. It's And the talk was really nice and elaborative. And uh, the talk will be posted soon in YouTube. So you can actually see the content of the talk in detail. Uh, for, uh, like, uh, for more to say, next talk will be given by Matias Zaldariaga from IAS Princeton. And the next one is given by Harman Nikolai uh, from Max Planck Institute. So I just want to comment one thing. Loga, uh, I just want to uh, send an email that, can you able to talk about your uh, recent paper, this Schwinger Keldish hologram? Are you there? Yes, yes, I, I, I think so. But let's decide on the dates and so on. I have to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I will write an email to you and uh, let's talk about that. Okay. So, Eva, thank you very much. And uh, we all uh, uh, have to say that uh, we need to fight against this situation. And uh, hopefully, things will be good soon. Stay safe, be safe, healthy, and uh, yeah. Are you there, Eva, or you left? Yeah, yes. Uh, let me just say thank you again for the invitation and the nice uh, discussion. Um, and uh, I wish you all the best. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, see you. See you.